Genesis chapters 38 and 39. We're going to talk a little bit about the character of two of Jacob's sons, and they're basically polar opposites. Uh, one of them is very uh, trustworthy. The other one is a little shady, and unfortunately, uh, we know a little bit about him already. The two are Judah and Joseph. If you remember from last week, talking about Joseph being sold into slavery, whose idea was it that he'd be sold to the Ishmaelites? Well, that was good old Judah. So Judah was the fourth son of Jacob and Leah. So in the in the standings of the family, he was really kind of an also-ran. He would not have held high honor among the family just because he, he wasn't born first. Reuben was the eldest. And, of course, Joseph was the firstborn from Rachel, which made him special to Jacob. And he treated him that way, gave him special clothing, gave him special honor in the family, listened to him while he uh, told on his brothers and got the brothers' attention to the point that eventually they banded together and got rid of him and told their daddy that he died. Uh, what is Judah famous for eventually, though? That's where Jesus comes from. He's from the tribe of Judah. So when you think about eventually, you don't even end up with a tribe of Joseph. Joseph's uh, tribal holdings get split between his two sons. So there's not really a, you, you don't have much of a tribe of Joseph down the line, but at least in this generation, the character of Joseph goes a long way toward saving his brothers and his family, whereas the lack of character of Judah becomes kind of infamous. We're going to start with Judah in 38. He has a full chapter dedicated to one of his uh, mistakes. Uh, this is later in life. Judah has three sons. Son number one got married to a local woman named Tamar. And Tamar was uh, unable to become pregnant by him during the time that they were married. And the Bible says that his son was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord got rid of him. So this young man, whatever, it doesn't say what he did. It doesn't say why uh, God got rid of him, but he dies. And it brings Judah into a, a situation that shows up a few times in the Old Testament, but it, it even ends up in the law of Moses. So it's kind of a, it's an oddity, and I don't remember if we've talked about it before, but it's called the law of Leverite marriage. Anybody, does that sound familiar? Have we talked about that? Well, you remember when Abraham could not have children with Sarah. Sarah says, I'm going to give you my handmaid, Hagar, and the children that would be born to Hagar actually would belong to Sarah. That was the, the idea, that she would have children on Sarah's behalf. Then Jacob gets Leah and Rachel, but he also gets Zilpah and Billah, uh, and the children born to them don't really belong to them. They belong to their uh, mistresses, to the women who own them. Well, a Leverite marriage was similar to that in the fact that when a, an older brother died, his younger brother, his next youngest brother, was responsible for having offspring in his name. So the job of the next son would be to marry the woman that his brother had been married to, and to give her children. But those children would not belong to him, and they would not be part of his uh, legacy. They would belong to his brother. So the second brother is told by his father, you have to take Tamar and you have to be uh, intimate with her so that she can have children on behalf of your brother. He wasn't having it, and the Bible politely says that he spilled his seed whenever he was with her. So he wasn't going to do anything that would impregnate her because he was spiteful about the whole leave right marriage situation. Wasn't going to have it. Uh, I guess we could break off for just a second and run to the New Testament. You remember the last week of Jesus' life, 
the Sadducees, who don't believe there is a resurrection, came to Jesus and told him a story about seven brothers. There were these seven brothers, and the oldest brother married the woman and didn't have any children, so the second brother married the woman and didn't have any children, the third brother married the woman and didn't have any children, all the way down to the seventh brother, and then the seventh brother died and the woman died. Whose wife is she in the resurrection? That was the question they asked Jesus. Uh, it's all about Levite marriage. It was an odd, odd custom among those people, but it had to do with maintaining the inheritances. Once they got back to Canaan from Egypt and God gave the allotments for the different tribes, it was important that every member of the tribe had their spot of land. In fact, if you sold your plot of land to a fellow Israelite in the year of Jubilee, your land came back to you. It was God said, this is the land for this family. So they would have the use of it for a while, but it was like they were leasing it, not like they would ever actually own it. So you had to give it back in the year of Jubilee, which was every 50 years. So, uh, so already at this point, Judah knows of that practice. He tells his second son to take care of it. The second son refuses, and the Bible tells us the second son died too. We're, we're not told specifically that God was angry with him, for spilling his seed and not impregnating the woman, but it's kind of hinted in the text. Eventually, uh, he has a third son, and he tells Tamar that if she will just remain a widow until the third son grows up, that then he will give the third son to her for a husband so that they can still fulfill their Leverite responsibilities. But he doesn't ever do it. And so Tamar is left after all these years with no offspring and she's just an older widow woman living in the family of Judah. So Judah decides that he is going to go down to where they're shearing his sheep. And on the way to shearing the sheep, he runs into this woman who is veiled from head to toe at a place where he was used to finding temple prostitutes. Now why Judah knew that there were typically temple prostitutes at that place, I don't know. But Judah saw her, assumed she was a temple prostitute, and asked her what the price might be. And they negotiated for a goat. He said, if you'll lie with me, I will later on pay you with a goat. She says, well, I'm going to need some collateral. He says, well, I've got a signet ring and my staff. I'll leave those with you. I've got to take care of some business at the sheep shearing. I'll go back home. I'll get your goat. I'll bring your goat to you, and then you can return my signet ring and my staff. Now, those were not two small items. The signet ring was the designation that he was the head of the family. You know, this is an identifier. This is like, uh, you know, put it in the wax and, you know, make your mark on a document kind of stuff. And his staff would have been recognizable to people who saw it. So he leaves with her a couple of things that he, I guess he wasn't too worried that folks would find out that he'd been with a temple prostitute. He goes on down. Oh, and by the way, I guess we, we better say, when we say temple, we're not talking about the temple. We're not talking about the temple of God. We're talking about a temple for one of those uh, Canaanite gods that they worshipped in that area. So he goes on, to, takes care of the sheep shearing, goes back home, gets the goat, comes back to pay her, and she's not there. Unfortunately for Judah, she becomes pregnant. And when she's about three months along, she announces, or he finds out, that she's pregnant. And he says, bring her to me and we will burn her. So we're going to burn this woman at the stake because she is pregnant. Uh, he never brought his son to her. He never kept his end of the Leverite marriage, but somehow she's become pregnant and he's going to kill her for it. When she finds out her sentence, she sends a note and asks him, would you please identify whose signet ring and whose staff that I have in my possession? And Judah says, she is more righteous than I am because I withheld from her my youngest son. So Judah, again, you have this story in the Bible for a purpose but it's hard for me to know exactly what the purpose is for the story. Why do we need to know that that happened? 
Well, Judah's character is shown as being not too solid. And it's going to be followed by a chapter in which Joseph's character is shown to be very solid. When I was teaching ethics, we would define character as who you are when nobody's looking. So you've got Judah who had poor character when no one was looking and only had enough character to, to step up after he got found out. And now we're going to talk about Joseph who had great character when no one was looking. So the one who sells him into slavery has poor character throughout. The one who is sold into slavery shows his good character over and over again. And uh, I'm not sure whether she ever got her goat or not. It doesn't, doesn't end that story for me. Uh, look at chapter 39. We'll, we'll read the first seven verses. Now we're get into the one we're a little more interested in. When Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Where did he live? In the house. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything that he owned. From the time that he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Who does that sound like? That sounds a lot like Jacob. Right? Jacob moves in with Laban, and Laban tells him later, I figured out by way of divination that the reason I'm getting so wealthy is that you're with me. Right? So God blesses Abraham and everyone who's connected with Abraham. God blesses Isaac, everybody that's connected with Isaac. God blesses Jacob, everybody that's connected with Jacob. And now we see the promise in the next generation. Joseph doesn't ever get the visit. Right? He never has an angel that comes to him and says that, you know, through your seed the nations will be blessed or any of those things. But the blessing of Abraham is obviously in Joseph in this generation. And everything he touches uh, turns out great. And people can trust him. Why is that? He has great character. This guy does what he says he's going to do and he's able to take care of things without somebody having to watch him the whole time. So Potiphar puts him in charge of his house. And then there's kind of, a, it's not necessarily meant to say this, but it, it kind of touches on it. Back in verse 6. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. There's a problem there. Right? Potiphar did what? Potiphar left. Potiphar assumed that everything was okay. And as far as Joseph was concerned, everything was okay. Where was the problem? Potiphar's wife, right? Potiphar's wife was going to be the problem, not Joseph. But as far as Joseph was concerned, Potiphar just kind of turned a blind eye. He assumed that everything was going to be the way it was supposed to be because Joseph was a man of great character. Potiphar's wife, however, was not a woman of great character. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. What does the King James say there? Anybody got the King James out in verse 6? He was, he was what? Handsome in form and appearance. Uh, he was well-built. He was a good-looking good man and a good man. After a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come, go to bed with me. She was very sly, very, 
you know, didn't, didn't want to come right out and say it. She just, you know, there was no seduction in this deal. She just came up to Joseph and said that she wanted to take him to bed, but he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or to even be with her. So we have this very difficult scenario. He lives in the house. So every time Potiphar is gone from the house, Joseph has to figure out a way not to be in the same place at the same time with Potiphar's wife. And over time, you could imagine that she was feeling slighted, and sometimes that will turn them away, and sometimes that means that I want it more because I can't have it. And it seems like she was the latter. She just kept trying to get him to go to bed with her. Uh, Notice what Joseph says about the activity itself. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You don't run into a lot of phrases about sinning against God this early in the Bible. It's kind of a later discussion about people who sinned against God. But he uses that phrase, I don't want to sin against God. So he's concerned a little bit about Potiphar. He wants to do a good job working for Potiphar. But his ultimate reason for living the life he's living is that he has a special relationship and a special understanding of what God expects from him. And again, that's true in our lives. We have certain relationships physically that we want to honor, but ultimately it's about our relationship with God. So even if we might start to stray in our relationships physically, hopefully our relationship with God reminds us and gets our attention back where it ought to be. So uh, she obviously was not a woman of character. She obviously was not connected to a god or goddess in Egypt that had enough of her attention that it would keep her from doing what she wanted to do. One day, he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me, but he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought has come to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and he ran out of the house. Does that sound like every uh, soap opera that you've ever watched? I mean, that's the plot. Uh, you know, try to seduce him. He won't have it. Lie about it. Get him fired. Get him killed. Whatever happens uh, in the next scene. So she is humiliated because she was unable to get what she wanted from Joseph. And her only recourse is to try to humiliate him. Right? If you won't have me, then nobody else will have you. When his master heard the story his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison in the place where they kept the king's prisoners. Why did Potiphar believe his wife? We could make a list. He'd known her longer. She was an Egyptian. She may have been from a well-off family because if you were the captain of Pharaoh's guard, you were probably married well. He got to sleep with her, right? So she's got that power over him. They have a sexual relationship. He doesn't want to lose that. So as much as he likes Joseph, Joseph can't add up. He doesn't have enough clout in this relationship for him to even ask the question. There's no he said, she said in this. She simply makes the accusation and the hammer comes down. It reminds me a little bit 
of some of the cases, not all of the cases, but some of the cases in the Me Too movement over the last couple of years where somebody just comes up and says, well, 20 years ago this happened, and we don't have to prove anything. We don't have to have a trial. We just, folks get fired and, you know, lives are altered because somebody said so. Well, that's kind of the way Potiphar goes at this. His wife says so. He takes her word for it, and he has Joseph thrown into prison. But look at the end of 39. While Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all, that, uh, all of those who were held in the prison. He was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. I find it easier to grasp Potiphar having Joseph you know, go up the, the chain of command and be in charge of everything in his household. That's easier for me to grasp than the success that he had in prison. He's put in prison and the prison warden gets to the place that he's like Potiphar. I don't have to worry about anything. If I let Joseph be in charge of it, it'll all work out the way it's supposed to. So we don't know exactly how long Joseph knows the warden before the warden gets to this place. But these Egyptian men are catching on quick that Joseph is a man of character. They don't have to look over his shoulder. They don't have to tell him twice. If it needs to be done, he gets it done, and he gets it done correctly so that everything that needs to happen is happening the way that it should. Now, think about the two guys we're talking about. One is the head of the armies of Egypt. Huge responsibility. If his household is out of order, people will notice. It never was. Joseph was a man of character. And now you have a prison where the political prisoners are kept. So the folks that are looking into this prison are folks who are connected. So you have people who have been employed by Pharaoh himself, probably people from the armies who have been court-martialed and put there, people from royal families who have been put in care in this place. There are people watching this prison that are going to want to know exactly how well things are going to be done. And Joseph doesn't disappoint. The warden gets a better reputation because Joseph is there. Potiphar gets a better reputation because Joseph is there. What they don't know yet, what they don't understand until much, much later is that that's not an accident. And it's not just about Joseph. There are some people who are not godly people who do good things. But Joseph's character was godly character. It wasn't just Joseph's character, and it wasn't just Jacob's family's character. This was a God thing. And as God was blessing Joseph, he was giving him clout in all of these situations so that eventually... He could get him to the right place at the right time to save the right people from whom Jesus would come so we could be saved. So Joseph saying no to Potiphar's wife, that's about our salvation. Joseph being popular in the prison and having the character to do what they needed him to do, that's about our salvation. They don't know it yet. We get to read backwards, right? We, we know how the story turns out, so we could go back and look and see how God got from point A to point B. But in this place, at least, Joseph shows his character, and he is exactly where God needs him to be, doing what God needs him to do. All right, so we'll leave it there, and Lord willing, pick up that storyline next week.